It was on a late July morning when our expedition party assembled on the outskirts of Cairo to travel for 10 days through some of the most desolate areas of the Western Desert. Starting from Cairo, we descended into the Qatara Depression. Heading towards Siwa Oasis, we visited many remote sites in and around Qatara. From Siwa, we ascended the Diffa Plateau towards the Mediterranean port of Saloum. Travelling along the north coast, we drove back to Cairo. The natural obstacles we were to traverse, soft sand, rough ground, unbroken escarpments, salt marshes and the infamous Sabcha, together with the obscure minefields, makes exploring these lands a treacherous undertaking. Katara was named after a water spring the Bedouins called Ain el Katara. They describe Katara as an awesome wadi. With its lowest point at 134 meters below sea level, the 20,000 square kilometer Katara Depression is by far the largest of its kind in the world. The petrified wood that dots Katara is believed to have been carried to its present location by ancient rivers from forests which existed several million years ago. Like a mirage, a distant oasis shimmered in the haze. It's the uninhabited oasis of Mogara. Sensing our presence, a fox sprang up from a hole which he thought was no longer safe. We followed, but only for a few seconds, to admire this enigmatic desert dweller. Apprehensive about the millions of mosquitoes that inhabit Mogara, our party stopped at a safe distance while I ventured into the oasis, protected with the appropriate gear. As a result of extensive evaporation and poor drainage, the strip closest to Mogara Lake has become salt saturated, yet many plants have adapted well to this saline crust. Whilst palm trees send their roots to the water table beneath, other plants depend upon the morning dew to endure. Surrounding this stagnant lake, lush plant growth and palm trees cover most of the oasis floor and cap the surrounding sand mound. As we travelled westward, we climbed the sand dunes of Khorud el Fors which is one of four major dune belts in Katara. It reminded me of the Persians who came to invade Siwa. Instead, they were engulfed by the blowing sand. A few poles still remain from the old British telegraph line through Katara. The Russians drilled for oil in this area during the early 70s, but struck water instead. This drinkable hot water comes from a depth of a thousand meters. It's reddish in color and very warm near the source. This spot is a clear example of Katara's fertility. Wherever water is available, buried seeds come to life. There are at least 16 plant species here in excellent condition. Though purely accidental, this oasis is an unusual example of a natural coexistence between man and the environment. Perhaps developers building resorts in the desert could learn a lot from this oasis. The Sabka stretches along the total length of Katara. It's been formed by the evaporation of groundwater seepage. A car or even a camel will sink deeply into it. Acacias can be found all over Katara, though their main concentration is here, in the extreme northwestern corner at Tal El Fawakir. El Fawakir is a Bedouin tribe from Arabia. Having settled in Libya, they crossed Katara on their pilgrimage route to Mecca. When one of their virtuous sheikhs died amongst these groves, their name duly became synonymous 
with the acacias of Talch and Thalawachia. We began ascending the escarpment towards Elgara Oasis. With our camp nestled amid the rugged cliffs, we set out to explore this captivating desertscape. At the extreme west end of Katara, an ancient fortified town rises over the hidden oasis of Gara. From a distance, it looks like a mythical shrine to the desert spirits. The arrival of strangers is a significant occasion in Gara. Upon our arrival, people appeared from everywhere greeting us. Haga Hassan, the oasis spokesman, and Sheikh Mahdi, the chief of Gara, joined in the welcoming party. We were led to the guest house, and Gara's leaders invited us in. As customary, we attended a simple reception and drank tea. We were also given dates and peanuts, the staple offerings of Gara. Hey. Hey. We asked Haga Hassan about the elusive desert cheetahs and the caracal. Oh. He told us that about 50 years ago, he and other desert companions came upon a cheetah devouring a gazelle. Alarmed by their presence, the cheetah departed. This was his last sighting of this magnificent creature. While lunch was being prepared, Haga Said and at least a dozen local boys showed us the sights of Gara. About halfway through our ascent to the ancient fortress, Haga Said showed us the tomb of a virtuous sheikh. The door squeaked open, and beyond it lay one of the most exotic tombs of its kind. It was decorated with ostrich eggs, as ostriches existed in the western desert as late as the 1930s. We entered the fortress through its only gate, which faces south. The fortress's walls are built of mud, while the reinforcement, gate and ceilings are out of palm tree logs. During the last flood, most of the fortress's walls and ceilings crumbled. Now the Karans live in plastered masonry and concrete houses. Their economy is still based around their palm groves and the few crops that they cultivate, irrigated by 17 Roman wells. They drink from Ein Kefa water, which is brought in weekly from 90 kilometers away. Our host led us back to the Mudiafa, where we ate a hearty meal of goat meat, rice and vegetables. Sheikh Hassan taught our party's youngsters a few words of the Berber language. Although at the present time, almost all of the 330 Quran speak Arabic, amongst themselves they speak Berber. As far as they remember, the people of Kara descend from a branch of the Hamada tribe, a mixture of Moribitine Arabs, Berber and Sudanese. As we prepare to leave, we are offered another round of tea and gifts from the people of Kara. Our generous hosts bid us farewell as we depart this enchanted oasis. We left the greenery of Kara to be engulfed again by the endless desert as we maneuvered southward through the rugged escarpment. We spotted a couple of gazelles which probably mistook us for hunters and fled. A desert rally passed through here, bringing havoc and leaving more behind. Four lakes extend in succession between the dunes of the Great Sand Sea and the southern edge of Katara. Around these lakes are the forgotten and now uninhabited oasis of El Bahrain, Nawamisa, Sitra and El Arag. They stand as primeval landmarks along the ancient caravan routes connecting Siwa to the rest of Egypt. Here, two lakes about five kilometers apart 
Mark El Bahrain, which incidentally means two seas. About a kilometer from the western edge of the lake lie tombs cut into the hills, proof that these oases were once inhabited for a long time. Snake tracks are a common sight beneath the half-buried palm groves. In the glimmering heat, which reached 55 degrees centigrade, we passed by Nawamisa. It's inhabited by millions of mosquitoes, which give it its name. The oasis and lake of Citra, the largest of the four lakes, offers a complete ecosystem rich in plant and animal life. We spotted a flamingo resting along the lake shore. It was a remnant of a migrating flock. El Arag hides 30 meters below sea level. Many plants, including remarkably high palms and tamarisks, grow here. This oasis was inhabited during the Greco-Roman times. We camped amongst the sand dunes, 30 kilometers southeast of Siwa. <laughs> Going to Siwa after a week's travel in the blistering summer heat of the desert, was a welcome event for all of us. After this glorious bath, we proceeded to Charlie's Marketplace, where we browsed for a couple of hours and replenished our supplies. Leaving Siwa, we ascended the Diffa Plateau. For the first 50 kilometers or so, we followed the trail of Darb Shafazak, which was marked for King Fawad I about 80 years ago. By the thousands, desert snails carpet large areas of the plateau. They seek nourishment by attaching themselves to the desert plants. Rough and rocky ground covers the surface of this plateau. The Diffa, or Marmarica Plateau, possesses a semi-dry coastal environment, unlike the hyper-arid interior of the Egyptian Sahara further to the south. This habitat supports a myriad of flora and fauna, the gazelle population in the western desert was threatened by desertification and overgrazing in many areas. Now, they are driven to the edge of extinction by hunting. Influential and wealthy hunters come to Egypt, armed to the teeth with guns, four-wheel drives and trained falcons. They wipe out large numbers of sand grouse, gazelles and any other poor creatures which cross their path, just for sport. A prominent wall stretched endlessly, east to west, like a frontier of some lost world. Here, the coastal plain came into view. We came upon the Allied installations of World War II. Though the war has ended and become a horrible memory, the minefields still harbour their hidden death. We entered the lands called El Ashreya, meaning the hospitable. The plant cover intensified and grazing livestock dotted the land. A herder named Aweda approached us, asking if we spotted his camels. Unlike goats and sheep that must be escorted by shepherds, 
Camels can wander for months and walk hundreds of kilometers before returning to the well they know. Aweda belonged to Aulad Ali, or Sons of Ali. It's Egypt's largest Arabian tribe. Three centuries ago, they left their homeland in eastern Libya to settle here. Their main territory in the western desert extends from the Mediterranean in the north to Katara in the south. We collected some roots from the scattered dry plants. The fire provided warmth on this cold desert night. The smell and the view of the Mediterranean greeted our senses as we headed towards the port of Saloum. In an attempt to solve a series of conflicts, the Egyptian-Libyan borders were rearranged, adding the plateau and port of Saloum to Egypt, whilst conceding the oasis of Jagboub to Libya. The Allied forces had built this cemetery for their victims of World War II. In this vicinity, the silent wilderness once hosted one of the most tragic acts of mankind. Thousands of soldiers came here to die, soaking this parched land with blood. fisherman's boat and headed west to explore the coastline from Saloum to Libya. This virgin shoreline with its rugged cliffs, sandy lagoons and its clear aqua blue waters boasted the real beauty of the north coast, still unspoiled by man. As the sun set, signaling the end of our trip, we gazed across the horizon. If only man's trace could vanish. If only good environmental planning and awareness is righteously implemented. Only then shall the beauty of this land forever remain. <laughs>